Good afternoon, and welcome to another episode of The League of Biblical Enthusiasts. Well, last week we discussed how Tischendorf described his find of Codex Sinaiticus. He claims he rescued those first 43 leaves from certain destruction by burning at the hands of the monks in the monastery of St. Catherine's in Mount Sinai. It's an account not all find convincing. So I provided links in the description below of his own story and how others have evaluated it in light of the events after 1844. Today, we want to simply describe the physical and textual characteristics of the manuscript itself. But first, what is the overall significance of the Codex? Well, at the time of its discovery in 1844, there were only three known ancient Greek manuscripts containing a near-complete Bible. And one of those had just recently been deciphered by Tischendorf a couple of years before. This would be, of course, Codex Ephraima Rescriptus. The palimpsest that was at the National Library of Paris that previous scholars had failed to read. The other two were Codex Alexandrinus and Codex Vaticanus. So Sinaiticus joined these three, and they are collectively referred to as the four great unseal manuscripts. Now today, the term unseal has been superseded by the word majuscule, although you will still see unseal used in certain places. A majuscule manuscript is one written in uppercase letters as opposed to minuscule, which is like a cursive script, a much quicker way to write. These four majuscule manuscripts are all dated to the 5th and 4th centuries AD, and their ancient dating and extensive text of the Bible is what gives them their prominence. We do have other manuscripts, some dated earlier, but none as both complete and early as these four. Noteworthy about Codex Sinaiticus is that it contains a majority of the Old Testament in Greek, including the Deuterocanonical books, also called the Apocrypha, and all of the Greek New Testament, including two additional books at the end, the Letter of Barnabas and the Shepherd of Hermas. Sinaiticus is the only one of the four great majuscules that contains the entire New Testament of 27 books. Now let's look a little more closely at two aspects of the Codex, its physical characteristics and its textual characteristics. So first, its physical characteristics. It is believed that the Codex originally consisted of approximately 730 parchment leaves, or about 1,460 pages, of which roughly 400 leaves survive today. The codex is made from vellum, which is a higher quality parchment made from specially prepared animal skin, most likely a young sheep or calf. It's estimated that the preparation of the codex required the skins of about 365 animals. And the cost of the material, copying time required by the scribes, and binding is estimated to have equaled the lifetime wages of one individual at the time. And I've left a video in the description of how parchment is made. And it's a very time-consuming process, a very expensive process, that has changed very little over 2,000 years. The leaves of Codex Sinaiticus range from approximately 15 inches tall to 13 and a half inches wide. In the case of the Codex, the quality of the parchment is fine. The folios have an amazing uniformity of thinness ranging between 0.1 millimeter and 0.2 millimeters. And I think it's helpful to describe the process of making vellum to get an appreciation of exactly how time-consuming it is. So, here we go in eight steps. Step number one, selecting and preparing the animal skin. 
Vellum is typically made from the skins of younger animals, like calves, because of their finer texture, although goat and sheep skins can also be used. Number two, skinning. The animal is skinned and the hide is cleaned of any remaining flesh or fat. Number three, soaking in lime. The skins are soaked in a lime solution for several days to loosen the hair and fat. This step is crucial for separating the skin's fibers and helping to clean the hide. And after soaking, the skins are removed from the lime and thoroughly wrenched to remove excess lime and dirt. Number four, de-herring. The skin is stretched on a frame with a special knife, today called a scudding knife, and it's used to scrape off the hair, the epidermis, and any remaining flesh from both sides of the skin. This process leaves the skin smooth and clean, ready to be stretched and dried, which brings us to step five, stretching and drying. The cleaned Skin is stretched tightly on a wooden frame. The tension is crucial to give the vellum its smooth, thin, and uniform surface. As it dries, the skin becomes taut and takes on a characteristic parchment-like appearance. The vellum is left to dry in this stretched position for several days or weeks, depending on the climate and the thickness of the skin. Number six, sanding and smoothing. Once dry, the vellum is removed from the frame and the surface is scraped and sanded with pumice or other abrasives to achieve a smooth and even texture. Additional sanding may be done on the hair side of the skin to make it more uniform and suitable for writing. Number seven, cutting and final preparation. The vellum is cut into the desired size for manuscript or other uses. Before writing on vellum, it's often lightly dusted with chalk or another abrasive powder to further smooth the surface and help the ink adhere properly. And lastly, number eight, storage or use. Finished vellum is typically stored flat or rolled until it's ready for use. It remains durable and flexible, making it a preferred material for manuscripts. Now, according to Eusebius, Constantine the Great ordered him to produce 50 excellent copies of the scriptures by professional scribes that would be delivered to churches in the empire. It is possible, though not certain, that Codex Sinaiticus could be one of those copies that survived. And the book survives as a codex, which replaced the scroll as the preferred format for important documents. The Codex was the historical ancestor of our modern book. Technically, the vast majority of modern books use the Codex format of a stack of pages bound at one edge along the side of the text. But the term Codex is now reserved for older manuscript books, mostly used sheets of vellum, parchment, or papyrus rather than paper. The Codex format eventually replaced the scroll and it appears that Christians played a major part. First, you could open the codex to any page and more easily find a specific passage, much more difficult to do with a scroll, which had to be unrolled sequentially until the desired passage was found. In addition, within a codex, you could write on both sides of the page. In a time when writing materials were prohibitively expensive, being able to optimize page space was a big advantage. And finally, codices were far sturdier and easier to transport than scrolls. Sinaiticus was produced using a standard method of ancient manuscript construction with choirs, which are called also gatherings, and folios, or leaves of parchment. A folio refers to a single sheet of parchment, which is folded in half to form two pages of the manuscript, front and back. The front of the folio is called recto, and the back is the verso. A choir is a group of folded sheets, or folios, bound together to form a section of a manuscript. In the case of Sinaiticus, the manuscript is made up of choirs of four sheets folded in half, making eight leaves, or 16 pages, per choir. The color of parchment varies with animal type. New parchment can be near white, but as it ages or exposed to 
detrimental factors, it will start to yellow and go brown to black if left to degrade completely. Those who specialize in parchment conservation have reached these conclusions about Codex Sinaiticus. Its parchment is from both calf and wool sheep in origin. It is exceptionally uniform in thinness. It is supple and flexible in quality, generous in bifolio size, lavish in layout, characterized by relatively few visual impairments and blemishes. The parchment condition is generally exceptional for its age. There is little to no significant degradation, but it is somewhat affected by long-term ink corrosion. As you might expect, Codex Sinaitic has been examined by many experts over time and their findings are recorded in detail at the CodexSinaiticus.org website. They've inspected wrinkles in the pages, tiny imperfections in the parchment, stains left on pages, insect marks, ink type, and so on. There's much more information than you'd probably want to know on that website. Now let's move on to describe some of its textual properties. As it survives today, Codex Sinaiticus comprises just over 400 large leaves of prepared animal skin. On these parchment leaves is written about half of the Old Testament and Apocrypha, the whole of the New Testament, and two early Christian texts not found in modern Bibles. Most of the first part of the manuscript from Genesis to 1 Chronicles is now missing and presumed to be lost. The Septuagint includes books which many Protestant Christian denominations place in the Apocrypha. And those books present in the surviving part of the Septuagint are 2 Ezra, Tobit, Judith, 1st and 4th Maccabees, Wisdom, and Sirach. The number of the books in the New Testament in Codex Sinaiticus is the same in our modern Bibles, but the order is different. Sinaiticus contains two other, other early Christian texts. One is a letter by an unknown writer claiming to be the Apostle Barnabas, called the Letter of Barnabas. And the second is the Shepherd of Hermas, written by the early 2nd century Roman writer Hermas. Codex Sinaiticus was copied by more than one scribe, according to Tischendorf and other scholars. Tischendorf identified four. Subsequent research decided there are only three, but it's possible that a fourth, and not the one that Tischendorf thought of, can be identified. Each of these three undisputed scribes has a distinctive way of writing which can be identified with practice. Between the 4th and 12th centuries, seven or more correctors worked on this codex, making it one of the most corrected manuscripts in existence. According to textual critic David C. Parker, who has written an important book on the codex, the full codex has somewhere around 23,000 corrections. How does the codex differ from what is known as the received text or the textus receptus, which is exemplified by the King James Bible? Well, we will limit our comments to differences in the text to the New Testament and compare those to the King James Bible, which is based on that received text. The text of Codex Sinaiticus was arranged in a four-column format. The text was written in what is called scriptio continua or continuous script. This was a style with no spaces between words. In the New Testament portion, Sinaiticus has a slightly different order of books than our modern, modern Bibles. For example, the book of Acts is sitting between Philemon and James rather than right after the Gospels. The book of Hebrews is placed between 2 Thessalonians and 1 Timothy. This just shows us that in the early centuries of the church, there was at that time no fixed order for the complete set. That would come later. Some have accused the Codex of, quote, omitting words and phrases, even whole passages from the Bible. And this point of view assumes that the Greek text underlying the King James Bible is the ultimate standard to judge all other translations and in my humble opinion, is not true. The King James Bible was based on relatively few and late Greek manuscripts. 
And six, since 1611, a host of manuscripts have been discovered that are much earlier than those upon which the King James Bible was based. So we must take into account all the manuscripts and all the traditions and make sure we are doing our best to discover the earliest form of the text. First, some notable differences between Sinaiticus and the King James Bible and those based on the received text. Mark 16 ends at verse 8 in Codex Sinaiticus. And the last words are, for they were afraid. Chapter 16 begins after the Sabbath has ended with Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome purchasing spices to bring to the tomb to anoint Jesus' body. There they encounter the stone rolled away, the tomb open, and a young man dressed in white who announces the resurrection. The two oldest manuscripts of Mark 16, dating to the 300s, conclude with the verse 8, which ends with the women fleeing from the empty tomb and saying nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is called the short ending of Mark, as opposed to the longer traditional ending, which ends at verse 20. Modern versions of the New Testament generally include the longer ending, but place it in brackets or otherwise format it to show it's not a part of the original text, as shown here in the NIV. Both Sinaiticus and Vaticanus end Mark at verse 8. But Codex Beze, Codex Alexandrinus, and Codex Ephraimi have the longer traditional ending at verse 20. Modern readers of the Bible, brought up on the newer translation since the King James Bible, have come to understand these differences are a normal result of the discipline of textual criticism, which seeks to compare manuscripts in search of the earliest form of the text. But in Tischendorf's day, the King James Bible still reigned supreme. And, of course, today there is a minority opinion is in this vein as well. And people considered the King James Bible's text inviolable and the Greek text upon it not to be questioned. So when readings from Sinaiticus became more widely known, as it did quite quickly, it created something of a stir and raised questions from the faithful, such as, why are there differences among manuscripts? Which Bibles do we trust now? Do any of these newer readings challenge the core teachings of Christianity? And as it turns out, Mark 16 was not the only passage that was markedly different from the King James Bible. In the Lord's Prayer, recorded to Matthew 6, 9 through 13, Sinaiticus doesn't have the last line which reads, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Is this consequential? Not really. But we do get used to certain phrases and have an emotional attachment for them, and it's hard to let go. Sinaiticus doesn't have the story of the woman caught in adultery in John 7, verses 53 through chapter 8, verse 11. It's just not there. In Mark 1, verse 1, the King James Bible has the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Sinaiticus doesn't contain the phrase, the Son of God. Does this mean that the Codex has omitted the divinity of Jesus from the text? Not really. In the same Codex, in verse 11, God's voice proclaims that Jesus is God's beloved Son. There are many more examples where we could show that the Codex differs from readings in the King James Bible. So, how do you, as a non-expert in these things, decide which text to believe? Well, like anything else, you do your best research with the best resources and come to your own conclusions. In my opinion, no central doctrine of Christianity is threatened by the newer translations. Now, in fair reporting, there are some who defend the traditional reading of Mark 16 as originally containing verses 1 through 20. 
For example, John Bergon from the 19th century, Maurice Robinson and James Snap Jr. from our times are a few examples. There are also some who defend as original the story of the woman caught in adultery in John 8. So links to these defenses of these texts and many other resources will be included for further research. And you'll see that in the description box below. But hold on, you say, what about those two extra books at the end of the Codex, the letter of Barnabas and the shepherd of Hermas? Are they to be considered scripture as well? Why are they missing from our Bible translations today? The inclusion of these books shows that some early Christian groups valued them as spiritually authoritative or instructive and valuable for devotional readings, but they did not make it in the final end to the canonical New Testament. Copying non-canonical texts alongside canonical ones was not unusual in early manuscript production. For several centuries, the letter of Barnabas was one of those disputed writings, antelegomena, it is called, of the church. Eusebius of Caesarea classified it with excluded text, but it was still popular in some circles. The Shepherd of Hermas was one of the most popular Christian texts in the first centuries of the church. It was considered canonical by the influential second century church father Irenaeus. And Tertullian, another prominent church father of the next generation, considered it scripture until his own theology changed and then he disagreed with it. Origen highly revered it, as did other Christian leaders. But over time, it did not come to full acceptance by the majority of the church and eventually failed to make it into the canon of inspired literature. And again, links to resources regarding these issues are in the description for your review. There's so much more. I think I mentioned last in our last episode that we have passed over the story of Constantine Simonides, who claimed to have written Codex Sinaiticus and would have given it to the Tsar of Russia as a present, but Long story short, it made its way to the, to the monastery of St. Catherine. Tischendorf found it there, believed it to be original, and hence we have the claim that it is a manuscript from the fourth century. Well, Simonides has been judged over time to have been a forger and his story false, but it makes for quite a read. So there will be links to what's called the Simonides Affair, also in the description. I've thought about perhaps putting an episode out dedicated to that because it is a fascinating story, kind of akin to the Shapira Affair a few decades later. But anyway, let's stop here. I hope I've piqued your curiosity for more. And if you've enjoyed this series on manuscript hunters, which we will continue, Please like and subscribe and share with your friends. Next week, our plan is to continue our series on manuscript hunters with yet another episode, this time featuring the Sisters of Sinai. You do not want to miss this one. It's the story of two spinster Presbyterian widows finding ancient biblical manuscripts in Egypt. It is too much to pass up. A fascinating story. So, I hope you will look forward to the next episode of The League of Biblical Enthusiasts. So, be well, and we'll see you again.